spiritual life. It's become a vital necessity. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I can't go Sunday to Sunday. I, I have to have that midweek fellowship with the saints. <laughs> and while I'm talking with you just for a moment, I'd love for you to look back in your notes and see the word will. Remember the will of God I've been talking about? And I want somebody to just speak out loud enough so everybody can hear it as to what definition I gave you of the word will. And so we'll go on from there tonight because we're still in the process of discovering. And then two weeks ago I shared with you also the recipe for the will of God out of 1 Thessalonians. And so I'd like for us to have some of this interaction before I get into my teaching tonight. But I just want to further commend you and to thank you for your faithfulness and to thank you for the way that your model leadership in Christian living and duty and Christian duties that you're, you're, you're living out in being here faithfully on Wednesday nights, Sunday morning, Sunday nights, some of you cannot, but most of you can. I just want to commend you for that. Um, it is just a strong example, a small sampling uh, of, of really what God can do in somebody's heart and somebody's life. How many, everybody listen, never look at your just saying, no. How would you feel if just on the spur of, moment, spur of the moment tonight that I decided I don't feel like going to church and I didn't come? Would you be glad or sad about that? Sad. Sad. Sad happy because we know Pastor Stephanie is stepping in. I would be concerned if there's any reason why you have to get Get the picture now. See, what I'm trying to say is that I'm, I'm commending you tonight because you know the importance of living out your Christian life faithfully. And the Bible says not to neglect or forsake the assembling of yourself. Now mind you, in the early church, they only met periodically because of the danger of being caught. And they had to do that in hiding. But at minimum, they met once a week. Because in those days, they didn't have a thing called what we call now weekends. They didn't have Saturday or Sunday else. By the way, in case you don't know how weekends came about, remember what God says, six days you shall work and the seventh day you shall rest, right? How do we end up with weekends? Let me tell you how that, that came about here in, you know, in America and around the world, well, most places. For the Jewish community, what day is their Sabbath? Saturday. 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 And Jews own the business <laughs> for the most part. That's right. So in his mind, you can work all day Saturday, but I'm not. Because that's my day off. But in America here in Canada and obviously everywhere where the Catholic Church was or Christendom, everywhere around the world, well, they were Christians. And so the Jews understood that and so did society that if we, if the Jews take the Saturday off, Christians meet on Sunday. That's the first day of the week, which is the resurrection day. And so Christians didn't want to work on that day. They wanted to worship because Sunday is our Sabbath. Those who believe in Moses believe Saturday is the Sabbath day, the, the seventh day for them. And for us, the first day of the week, because we don't celebrate the law, nor uh, Moses, but we celebrate Christ and Him resurrected from the dead. And so we came, weekends came about because of faith, because the Jews wanted to be in church uh, and, and sitting on worshiping. And the Christians wanted on Saturday, and the Christians wanted to be in church on Sunday. And so, but midweek was never around until much later on. Uh, but midweek, I think, is, has become a staple for Christianity, for at least the Protestant community, the Protestant side of, of, of Christendom. 
it's become a staple for us. How many understand that uh, to go, I saw this one time on a bulletin, uh, not a bulletin, but on a marquee, it says, one week without church makes one week. Don't you eat anything? <laughs> And, and so to, to, to wait that whole period of seven days until we meet again seems like it's, it is a long time. Yeah, it seems like an eternity. And especially if you have to, if you're not feeling well, you have to miss a Sunday and a Wednesday. And you have, oh, that's an eternity. But for me, I think that it's become a staple because we've seen the benefit of it. And so I commend you tonight and I want to thank you. Now, has anybody... Uh, found their notes. What does the word will mean? Does somebody give us a description? Anybody found their notes? The will. The will. What's the meaning of the word will? That the will of God be done. What does the word will mean? What is the word will? What's the description? Some of you can look back in your notes. Maybe you have to look back too far. But just in case you left, maybe you don't have to look back too far. Well, let me tell you, how many remember me saying something about the word prerogative? Yes. Prerogative means first choice. Change <laughs> Well, that, I made a comment on that as well. Remember, it's always said, you know, when a man is ready to go out the door, she's ready to go out, and then she said, wait a minute, and then you have to wait, and then she went back and changed the dress. So what are you doing? Well, I'm changing. What do you want to do that for? The dress you have It's a woman's prerogative. Everything's a woman's prerogative. She has first choice. And we extend the courtesy, the gentlemen do. And we just have to wait because every time she makes an action on first choice, usually it's really nice. It's, it's, it's good. And so what does that mean when we want God's will in our life? We interpret that to mean that we want God to have first choice. We want God to have the prerogative of our life. Is that correct? Right. That's yes. the whole point. Yes. Now, it is not complicated. God's prerogative is not complicated. How many times in the last three or four months that I have uh, brought the particular scriptures that said, and this is the will of God. This is the will of God. This is the will of God. Do this so you'll know what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So God has shown us his prerogative. His prerogative, he has shown us his first choice. And how many know that in this case, Father knows best? Amen. Amen. I... Uh, I fixed the sign out there we have. Remember it says, you cast, you know, uh, cast your burdens on the Lord and He will sustain you. Yes. And he will sustain you. Somebody took the S from sustain and put it on the He for He, she will sustain you. The nervous some people scared. <laughs> they, they put the S on the He so that she, God, she will sustain you. Be as it may. I want to tell you tonight that God has manifest, He has laid out for us what His will is, what His first choice is. And how many believe with me tonight yet that God's prerogative is the best choice for us? Amen. Father knows best. Let's say it together. Father, Father knows, knows best. best. And those of you who are old enough to remember Robert Young and Father knows best, you appreciate that. Yeah. Until his wife had to step in a few times to make some corrections. However, that's her prerogative <laughs> to disagree. But anyways, so God has not. Does anybody remember what the recipe was? Determination. Uh, it, it, to make a determination. Yeah, to determine, to make that determination. God has made that determination for us. What he wants for our lives. It's not complicated. Now, there are some people who are looking for God's will concerning their life in service and ministry for the Lord. I know that there are some good men and good women out there right now that are not attending church, they're not worshiping anywhere, and they're not ministering anywhere. And when I speak to them, I ask them, well, you've been in ministry, what are you doing right now? I said, praying, 
and asking God to show me his will. Oh, where are you attending? Nowhere. Where do you worship? Nowhere. Where are you serving God in any capacity? Nowhere. How many know that it's hard to drive a parked car, Jameson? Is that right? If you're, I remember when I was a kid, Uncle John uh, was only one of two in our total, total extended family. John, Uncle John, and Uncle Bob were the only ones that had cars in our family. Everybody else hitchhiked or they took the bus, okay? And Uncle John had a 56 Chevrolet Bel Air. Beautiful car, light blue on the bottom and white on the top. And he'd come and visit us from the South Shore of Montreal, he came to Hadley Street, and he'd park his car right out there. And it was a summertime, and the four windows were down, and I'd mosey on down the stairs outside, and I'd go on the sidewalk, get into the car. You should have seen me drive that parked car. I had my arm out the window and I had my hand on that steering wheel. You should have seen me going down the road. Yes, sure was. How did you get to practice? The only thing I did, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have the sunglasses on, but it sure felt like I did. You know, I was ready going out there. That's you how you can't, drive now. <laughs> so I was. You can't drive a parked car. God cannot use immobility. You might want to remember the pastor about accept that. God cannot use immobility. God can't steer a parked car. He can only slap it to wake it up and get a hold of it, man. Get a life. Jesus gave such an eclectic variety and selection of service anywhere from being a top rank apostle with Jesus Christ all the way down to giving somebody a cup of water in his name. Anything and everything in between is service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't tell me that you're going to sit on your family at home waiting for God to reveal to you what he wants you to do for him. It does, it's just not, as a matter of fact, anybody that comes to me and tells me that hasn't been in church for six months because he's waiting on God, I, I don't want to talk to you. Don't even, don't even, that's an insult to my intelligence, insult to any experience of ministry. Don't insult my intelligence. No, sir. I, have, I don't trust you. You can't be trusted with anything. If you had a gift, it would be like Jeremiah, like fire burn up inside of your bones and you wouldn't be able to hold it back. You'd have to serve God somewhere. Amen. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to rejoice in the tents of the riches of the wicked. How many know that if you really want to serve God, there's something you can do to bless somebody in their life? Amen. So God wants us to, to be busy for Him. Matter of fact, don't miss this Sunday. This Sunday is when we're conferring on many people the certificate of a Christian worker, the Christian ministry worker, this coming Sunday. And I, I have a special message that's designed just for uh, that particular service. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be an important service. We're going to be handing out, we're going to be praying over these people. And it's going to be just a tremendous thing. And so I want you to understand something. God has already laid out the simplicity of His will. And so. What's the recipe that we gave last time we were here? It was in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Can you see? What was that recipe? Huh? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Yeah, it, it begins. Yeah, first, verse 18 says that in everything give thanks for this is the will of God. Christ is going to get so, But the will of God starts back, I think, in verse 13 or 14, if I'm not mistaken. 12, is it? Somewhere in that area, right? I'm just trying to do it by memory from a couple of weeks ago. And so, just quickly, throw some at me now. What are some of the things that you find in there that is the will of God? What's that? Yes, that's the verse, what, 15? Pray without ceasing. Yes, that's later on in the verses. What's it back in verse 12? Recognize those who labor among you. That's very important. That's where it begins. You know, if you're working at a job somewhere, you better find out who the foreman is, find out who the supervisor is, find out who the boss is, and who the owner is. You better find out who you're working for and who you're working with. 
It's important to know who the leaders are in that place. It's important, how many believe it's important for the church members to know who the pastors are and to know them, I mean really know them, by their example and by their model leadership. So know them that labor among you. What else does he say in there? Be at peace with yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. How many of these two things right now, that's the will of God. That's part of the recipe. Part of the recipe. Be at peace. How many believe that God is a God of peace? Yes. Right? I have come to bring peace. I am the Prince of Peace. I'll give you peace, not as the world gives it, but I, as I give to you, I give to you right now. So, we have recognized those who labor among you, and to honor them, because I brought you all the way over to Hebrews chapter 13 with that. Is that correct? Is it 17 or 18? 17? Um, Diane, I, I'm, I'm draining more memory capacity from you again. Because as you're losing your memory, I'm gaining my back. Everybody's about to lose something. <laughs> I'm ready to lose more hair. She crowns me. But anyways. And so it's important to, to honor those and recognize those and highly esteem those pastors in love who labor among you. That's the first, first, first ingredient is to recognize the line of authority. Recognize the line of authority. How do you know that in the church there is a line of authority? Amen. Right? There's a line of authority. Right. And don't, don't rebel or don't, don't fight against that. That's not something that Pastor Stephen and I all of a sudden showed up and came up with an idea. God established that from the very beginning with his relationship between man and himself. God established it that way. So then be at peace among yourselves. What's the next one? What's the other one? Huh? Yes, exhort those and warn those that are unruly among you. Yes. It's important to watch out for one another. Is that correct? Yes. What else do we have? This is the will of God. It's called body ministry. We'll look at that again this coming Sunday. What else do we have? Comfort the faint-hearted. That's all part of God's will. Thank you, Gary. Uphold the weak. I'm going to believe that's God's will. If we have... This Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, all over again. This, this particular part, uphold the weak. Those who are struggling in living out their new life. Those who are trying, like, you know how little uh, one and a half year old, something like that, two year old, they're learning how to get up and to walk. The year old, year and a half, right? And they slip and fall. What do you do? You pick them up, you comfort them, you kiss the boo boo. And you put them back on their feet. Why? And, and they'll naturally go back on their feet because they were designed to walk. And so Christians, by recreation and rebirth, are designed to walk. So that if they fall, they need somebody just sometime just to pick them up and comfort them, kiss their boo-boo, reassure them, and set them on their way. That's all part of it. And what's the next one? Be patient. How many believe it's important and it is the will of God for us to be patient with one another, right? See, we're very, very patient with you. And you're very, very patient with us. That right, Stephen? It's important to be patient. Wow. <laughs> I love it. But if you're here, I'm going to pick on you. That's, what, that's the right. What else do we have? See that none renders evil for evil to anyone. How many believe that's God's will? Amen. Amen. There's no tit for tat in Christianity. Right? But always pursue that which is good for yourself and everybody. What's the best course of action or reaction in this matter? Then in verse 16, of course, it goes on with the uh, small, the small, the short sentences. It says, rejoice always. That's part of God's will. How many believe God wants you to enjoy the strength of rejoicing? In other words, a person that has a spiritual blessing through the Holy Spirit of a thing called joy. Love, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on and so forth. So joy is part of, the Bible says in Nehemiah 8.10, neither be you sorry, for the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. Amen. And he's talking about serving other people who have needs. Serving. There's a joy. Serve the Lord with gladness, the Bible says. So there's joy in all of this. 
So it is God's will for us. Because why? That joy is your strength. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed that a happy person is hard to make sad? It's hard to make them sad. You notice that? It just you can just you know stick your stick your tongue out at it. You can go cross-eyed. You know you can just do and just call them names and else, and they won't get mad. It says uh, I read one time it said smile and confuse your enemies. <laughs> smile and confuse your enemies. A joyful person seems to be a Teflon person. It seems that nothing sticks. <laughs> Too bad. You just keep the trouble. It gives you strength. By enjoying the conversation. See? So rejoice always. What's the next one? Pray, Pray without ceasing. How many know that's God's will? But wait, what did we say about that, Lord? And didn't we not say God's not expecting us to be on our knees like a monk or a nun in a, in a, in a convent or in a monastery somewhere? But it's to have an open communication with God on a constant basis. As a matter of fact, God is so desirous to communicate with us, if He finds you too busy for Him to get through your mind and your heart during the day, He may give you a dream, He may wake you up during the night to get a hold of you. But God will get through somehow. He wants to bestow upon you, again, His plan and His will. So, so pray without ceasing, calling upon the name of the Lord. The next one is also very, very good. And everything give thanks. Uh, again, this is the will of God in Christ. So when he says this, but I'm going to stop there for a minute. But in everything give thanks, this will of God. When he gets to this verse 18, he's not just, he's not restricting this is the will of God in verse 18. Giving thanks, although it is part of the will of God. But everything that we started with from the very beginning to recognize those who labor among you, all the way up to now, and he closes with this. He says, give thanks on top of all of this. Now this is what I just mentioned. All of these things is the will of God in for you and your life. Okay, now what does it mean? This is what God wants us to do. This is how he wants us to behave. This is the demeanor he wants us to have. This is the approach to life. And this needs to be our biblical worldview of a life. Because we know as full gospel, spirit-believing, spirit-filled people here at Calvary Community Church is that the Word of God is the final authority for faith and practice. I think that Pastor Stephen, we're in living in an age in America where a lot of people make claims to their faith and what they believe, but the practice part of it is somehow dropped off. That's just like trying, trying to drive or ride a two-wheeler bicycle with only one wheel. And that, my friend, is not the easiest task. It is faith and practice. Many people believe a lot of things, but they're not practicing, they're not living it out. And what they believe is not living out through, through that. Do you make sense? Does that make sense? What they believe is not active. It is not energy, energizing them. It is not dominating their thinking. Hmm. So, everybody say faith and practice. Look at your neighbor and tell them, practice what you believe. Look at the other one and tell them, I will. How many believe in the love of God? Amen. Practice it. Amen. You believe that Jesus is coming soon? Amen. Practice it. Yes. Live by it. Live in consequence of it. Turn with me to 1 Peter. We're going to talk some more about the will of God. Chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. I'm looking forward to having our, pul our pulpit back here, our podium, if you can have that back. Chapter 2 of 1 Peter, and we're looking at verse 15. Oh, here's another one of those. This is the will of God. <laughs> Did you see that? Look at that all over again. Okay. This is the will of God. 
that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is the will of God. Now, I said, what, what does all that mean? Wait. He's going to explain it in just a moment. He said, Ignor how, how, how many in your, in your entourage, in your circle of, 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 of life, you know some people that are flat out ignorant. Amen. Amen. And they practice what they believe. <laughs> That's the worst part of it. I find that ignorant people practice their faith. Morton knows that. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they're waiting and some are ignorant by choice. They know better. And this is what John also said. This is the thing. You know to do well and don't do it for you is sin. And so, this Lord God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, now you notice, I want you, I want you to pick up on something here. How many know that you can't fix stupid? Amen. Is that true? Amen. That's right. And guess what? You can't fix ignorance. Amen. You can't fix it. Watch now, watch now. But God can. Yes. And God is looking for tools in order to do that. And Peter is saying here, this one God, that by doing good, by living out your life, by practicing what you believe, by doing the good works of God, that will instruct them more than your argument to the ignorant. I'm, 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 the, the fact in Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs especially, it says, don't argue with a fool. Don't argue with a fool. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before the swine. Don't, don't, don't dispute ignorance. Because it's endless genealogies in some places in the scriptures. It talks about it. Endless arguments. I, I, uh, James, I think, said it best. When he said, some boast of their faith, he said, I'll not say a word about my faith, but I'll show you my faith by my works. Amen. Let my works do it. And you know, guess, guess who said that first? Jesus. He said, if you can't believe me, what I say, then believe me for the very works sake. Why? Because the works that I do are I do not of myself, but the Father in me, He doeth the works. Look at what I'm doing. Let that convince you. Let that come through to your heart. Let that convince you that what I'm saying is not bogus, that what I'm saying is not some old Disney's fantasy world, that it is truth. And you'll know the truth, the truth is that you're free. So Jesus said, you can't believe me, believe me for the very word's sake. And so Peter is taken up on this, and so does James. And they're both saying the same thing. James said, I will show you my faith by my works. And this is where the church has failed. Especially in Protestant evangelical churches. Why is that? Because, especially full gospel Pentecostal. Why is that? There's so caught up in the spiritual matters that they're no earthly good. Let me say that again in case you weren't here when I said that. Let me, let me explain to you. We've heard this expression that goes back 50, 60 years ago. Some people are so heavenly they're no earthly good. Some people are walking in the clouds of, of spirit discernment and they contort their facial features like, oh my God, I'm in the twilight zone. God is talking to me. Oh, shut up. When's the last time you went and fed somebody that was hungry, turkey? When's the last time you shook somebody's hand? I have met big name preachers all of my life. And you go to shake their hand and they're too busy. They can't even shake your hand. They're so heavenly. They're no earthly good. 
So Paul said, if I have all the faith in the world to cast out devils and remove mountains, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. I'm a tingling cymbal and a, and, and a sounding brass. I'm, I'm just a big noise. I'm worthless to God. So Paul said what to the Corinthians? He said, when I came to you, I came to you in fear and trembling. I didn't come to you with words of enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He came with works. I'm glad that Calvary Community Church were involved in the community. This community knows we're here. Amen. By the hundreds. And because of our texting, by the thousands. Indeed. So, to silence the ignorance of foolish men, verse 16. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but bond servants of God. Let me explain that a little bit. Um, again, in Romans chapter 16, uh, Paul is saying to the Romans, he said, uh, don't use your liberty, also to the Corinthians, don't use your liberty, I think it's also 15, in the early parts of 15 and 16, don't use your liberty as a means of a stumbling block for a weaker brother. In other words, I don't mind eating pork. I don't mind you. Y'all are southern. I mean, listen, I, you know, the pulled pork here is is just the menu. I'm sorry. It's, in fact, uh, where were we? Uh, yeah, that subway here. In fact, they finally they got pulled pork barbecue right next door right now. Barbecue sandwiches over at the subway. Uh, so, but how do you know that there are people? who are convicted of eating pork. But they believe that God's against that. Although it's Old Testament, uh, ecclesiastical law. That's fine. If you're, if you're convinced that it's a sin to eat that, listen, don't offer them pork. I'm free to eat pork if I want to. And I'll even down a Pepsi with it too. Amen. You know? You can back that up with a little cupcake and a coffee on top of that. I mean, but some of these people don't believe in pork nor in Pepsi or coffee. So what am I going to do? Am I going to offer that? that to, no. I'm free to eat it. I'm free to consume what I feel God will feel guilty about. But if I'm among people who are... I, listen, it is wonderful to have the years of, of, of experience. Um, I was preaching a revival in Saskatchewan, Canada... That's right in the prairie provinces of Canada. And uh, what's funny is that the, the, the name of the church was Free Pentecost Church. Free Pentecost. Free Pentecost. And so I was scheduled, I came all the way from British Columbia, this is 1967. Uh, yeah, no, 68, I'm sorry. This is summer of 1968. I was, uh, and I went to preach in a little town, a little church, built 